couple producers, John Sloss is here. And yeah, I really want to ask uh, Jonathan Searing from IFC to please stand up wherever you are. Jonathan Searing, are you here? He's in the back. There he is. He's the guy at IFC who gave us a little money every year for 12 years to do this film. It was the as you can imagine, a really impractical, crazy movie to, to try to undertake. And uh, he wins a special medal for jumping through hoops every year at the corporate level when they say, what the fuck is this on the books that comes out 10 years from now? And what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so thank you for believing in us all these years. It, we wouldn't be here without you. So, I don't know, there's so many more people to thank, but... I mean, over 450 people, cast and crew, worked on this over the 12 years. So, I mean, that's, that's incredible. How did it feel watching it today? You premiered at Sundance. You were in Berlin, yeah. Berlin and here. So how does it feel bringing it here? That was wonderful. I mean, I love the Paramount. <laughs> I love watching movies here. What about you, Ethan? What was that like? You've seen it. Or anybody. Um, it's strange seeing that there's certain elements that nobody reacts to here that, you know, when they do the uh, salute to the Texas flag in Berlin, people are really confused. <laughs> and, uh, but the truth is, I mean, um, playing here at South By for this audience here today, it's kind of what you make the movie for. Um, I really, every time I've ever been here, uh, the way that this town supports movies, it, just to see you guys here today, it really, it's, it's finally finished. You know, that's what it feels like. You know, we, we started this so long. Laurel, I was just a little girl. And um, uh, it's actually be done today. It's what it feels like. So it's done. Well, let's hear from uh, Eleanor Marlott. It was a really beautiful experience. Uh, I've grown up going to this theater. It's a really sentimental place for me. And uh, seeing that particular movie on the big screen was... A lovely experience. I think growing up, I like when I imagined the movie playing. I always kind of imagined it playing here. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. let's go straight to the audience. Questions? Yes. feel that way about making it. Just to repeat the, the question, it was that this was so amazing, she doesn't want to see anything after it, uh, actually. She's back uh, the festival. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. pretend I didn't say that. But the question was how much of it was organic and how much of it was written. And well, it's all written and constructed. I mean, it's not a documentary, so... I mean, it's, it was all planned out and rehearsed. And, I mean, we put so much thought and pre-production and time into this over the years. But, you know, usually we shoot about three days a year, but you still have to cast and location scout and get a crew. And, you know, so it was, everything about this movie was odd uh, and kind of impractical, kind of crazy. You know, at the end of the day here, we're here. We spent a year in pre-production. You know, for a shoot that we shot, I think, total 39 days. But... A year of pre-production, two years of post-production. I mean, everything about it is just doesn't make sense. So, well, I think what, the, what people, when they look at it, is sort of like as you envisioned it when you were thinking. You, you knew it was going to be twelve years going forward, right? Yeah, the twelve years so. thing came from first through twelfth grade. You know, the public education. You're kind of sentenced to that. And I remember as a kid thinking, like, <laughs> I'll be an adult, or life will change, or something will be great after that. So. <laughs> and then when you adjust, so you sort of had this sense of an arc, and then how much did you tune into what was happening with your, your real, your characters? Oh, very much. I mean, I always knew, I mean, there were all these ideas going in, of course, kind of an outline, but it was, you know, it was very collaborative. You know, Ethan's worked with me a bunch over the years. Patricia uh, kind of knew what was, her character, what was going to happen. But every year we would spend time, you know, talking about, you know, the ideas for next year and what was going on. and. I mean, obviously, Lorelai, I kind of knew always what was going on in her life, but, you know, Eller, or maybe I didn't, but, um, <laughs> Eller, <laughs> Eller, uh, yeah, we were just like, felt like family. We would talk throughout the year, you know, 
and uh, I would just developmentally see where he was at. You know, and, and somewhere along the way, he became a collaborator just like Ethan or Patricia or anybody else. And we'd have scenes and ideas, we'd workshop them, a lot of rehearsal. And how much, actually for, for you kids, how much did it, your feelings about being in it change over the time period, you know? Um, you signed on when you were quite young. Well, there was one year when um, I asked my dad if my character could possibly die. <laughs> that, was, that was the Harry Potter year. She really didn't want to dress up. <laughs> eventually I was grateful to be part of the project. Rebellious <laughs> phase. But for the record, for the record, I didn't drag her into this project. I would have been disowned as a father had I not cast you when you were eight years old. She was singing and dancing and all that stuff. Wanted to be an actress, but then she's a painter now, so that sort of changed over the years. But Eller 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 was six when I met him. My feelings changed a lot, I think, but definitely as I got older, I became a lot more invested, I think, in the project and just kind of grateful for, for it and just aware, I guess, of what, what it really was that we were doing. Well, the, the casting is so crucial about like picking, yeah. knowing this kid that you're going to go on this journey with, and it was, yeah. you know, how did you just know, or you went through a million kids, or I mean, met a lot of kids, a lot of kids. That was certainly the big leap. That was the big decision on the, this movie. I remember, yeah, meeting a lot of kids. Eller just had this kind of special quality. He was acting at, at that time. He had been in a movie and I think a few other things had a headshot and resume, so he kind of already showed some intention and his family was behind it. A lot of it, when you're casting someone that young, you're really casting the parents. You know, his parents are artists, and you needed that family support, because this was a long, you know, they had to see some value in it, that it was some kind of artistic thing that maybe would be a good, hopefully a good thing in someone's life, not a some kind of awful burden. And, and you know, you can't, do, I found out along the way, you can't contract anyone it's a good thing. You can't contract anyone to do anything more than seven years, legally. So we were all taking this huge leap of faith. The, the, our making of... Um, That's why I'm renegotiating my contract now. Yeah, right now. <laughs> I see some possibilities We're going to call our making of documentary from the kid's point of view, um, 12 Years a Slave, I think is what <laughs> So, oh, can I give a shout out to Zoe Graham, who's Sheena, in town from college? Just say hi. I saw you out there. Please hope the cast members are here, but a special Sheena. She's great. But you know, I mean, Eller, I don't know if I can speak for you, but you know, one of the things that was so interesting about working with you on this is watching... You always had an interest in acting in anything artistic. You always had a real interest for it. And, but watching you learn how to become an actor. I mean, that's what really happened through the course of it. And Rick has an extremely unique approach to making movies anyway. I mean, you know, the collaborative process we have on, that started on Before Sunrise, you know, I, I was not that much older than you are now when I worked with Rick the first time, in which he basically brings you into a room and has the outline and the graph of what the thing is going to be about. But the details of how you get from A to Z He's willing to collaborate and hear you on and invite you to be a filmmaker with him. And I mean, I think that's what he did with, did with you, with both of you guys, in watching you guys. At first it was kind of an experiment and kind of fun, and then it became something we were, it became our kind of joint art project about, it was these parallel lives. Kathleen, too, I mean, you joined in, this was a, this was a long-range commitment for you. Do you have any idea what you were signing on for? Oh, fun. I mean, it was, no, I, um, I, I I lucked out, you know, I mean, what a great project to be, you know, brought in on and to get to participate in, and, and people could say, well, what are you going to do after this, and I'm like, I, I don't think I can top this, so I don't know. Cool. Audience? Yes? Okay, uh, okay, well, first off, uh, killer soundtrack, really, I love it. First off, killer soundtrack, loved it. Uh, uh, Save Houston was awesome, because I was born and raised in Houston, so I was, I was awesome. Uh, my question is, how were you able to keep the, uh, the look of the film constant with the different changes in film technology over the past year? The question is, how are they able to keep the look of the film constant with the yeah, changes in technology? Yeah, a huge concern, a huge concern. In 2002, when we started, I mean, that was the idea. I, did, I wanted the film to seem like one film, not a series of films or anything like that. So I think the biggest single choice was just choosing to shoot on film, 35. 
You know, I knew, I knew, I don't know how many films in Pet South by this year are shot on film, but this is one of them. We're um, only one, showing one on One of the few. Really? The original in, in Godzilla. 35. The original Godzilla is the only one that we're showing yeah, in 35. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're digitally projected. Because I knew we would have this digital finish, but, you know, 35 negative is still the most consistent thing you, know, you can get. So that was a big decision. And just the tone of it, trying to keep it, you know, similar style. I didn't want it to, I wanted there to be no visual indicators from the film. It would just come from what you're looking at. That was the big idea, I guess. In the back, I think yeah, we got somebody's black She's standing by now. I'm trying to go, get ready if they will go to you next, but in the back on the side there. How much did the ultimate arc shift through time? Um, well, I knew we knew 12 years would pass, and that, that would be the arc itself, really. I mean, um, but not so much. I mean, I, I, I knew the last shot, I think, of what the movie was going to be, year two, I think. I kind of knew. You explained the movie to me, I guess, 13, 14 years ago, you know, just in New York. Rick came to New York and talked to me about what this idea of this movie would be, and it's shocking to me despite all the weird variables of time and how life changes and everything, how much the movie looks exactly like you said it was going to look about 14 years ago. Yeah, that was my hope, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, yes, in the, in the mezzanine, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Um, could you publish the Blacklist, uh, the Black Album list? The Black Album. Yeah. Can I, can yeah. I it's great. For that? It's great. Yeah. Um, that was yeah. my present to my 15-year-old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that so much. He's yeah. seen, and he's a musician. I'll burn it for you if you want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're hoping you can like it'll be an iTunes thing at some point. You can get. I want. The I want Paul and Yoko and the, the States to get together and, and do it as a tribute album. You know, like because it's 1970, 1980. It's a great collection, and I really. <laughs> you know, and I help. Because we shot more of that scene. There was Ethan was kind of you, you were talking how much you liked the songs, but you were also kind of saying what's wrong with each Beatles uh, solo <laughs> stuff. You cut out. Too much of this, too much of that, too much. Of so I cut that part out. So maybe we'll we'll get. Yeah, we can talk about John's self righteousness and Paul's goofiness and George's over spirituality. <laughs> Played it very well. And all that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, blue blue shirt in the mezzanine. Yeah, you. Well, added all the music later, but it was kind of the ongoing process in the post-production was, um, you know, listening to the music from that year and kind of guessing, or just trying to have our ear to the ground on what, I mean, I'm out of that demographic. It's different from me. So I was, I had a couple uh, consultants that were around these guys' age who were, yeah, I mean, it was, listen, well, Eller's taste was so far beyond, you know, he's eight, what do you listen to, Eller? Oh, Tool, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, he was not much help in this category. <laughs> oh, the second grader we listened to or watching, Eller didn't qualify. He's watching Hostel, he's watching, you know, whatever. <laughs> Do you, you know how Eller, Eller doesn't say this to Rick, but one of the ways Eller was smart enough to separate himself from all the other kids who come in at audition, because Rick asked him, um, does he like any movies? He said his favorite movie was Waking Life. And that <laughs> compliments get you everywhere in life. I don't remember that. A six-year-old you seen Waking Life? Oh, well. <laughs> Print the legend. I don't know. Um, but no, the music, I knew, to answer your question, I knew it would be a big factor. The way cinema and music works particularly in a period film, it, music's a really powerful, um, you know, emotional memory recall thing. And uh, I knew it would be, you know, so, but it was just a question of what. So a lot of those consultants and people, I had them say what the song meant to them. Like, oh, I remember, you know, after my first kiss, driving with this, you know, I wanted someone to have had an experience, even though it wasn't my experience. You know, I wanted someone to have, that song had meant something to them. But as we got older, you know, the, the taste of Mason becomes more like Eller's taste, and I do more of that music, too, as, as they got older. It was stuff I was listening to. Jim? Uh, Richard, 
we see the characters change and grow up in the film, but your life also over those 12 years really changed. So how as a director do you keep alive that original vision and still be in the reality of your life today as a director? The question is that um, Richard's life changed a lot over these 12 years, so how did you keep the vision sort of intact? <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, it's a question. How much does your life change in 12 years? How much doesn't it? You know, I remember, obviously, for the kids, I mean, it's double their life at that point. So that's a huge amount of change. But I remember when I called up Patricia Arquette and talked to her about maybe playing the mom, one of my things I said was like, well, where are you going to be 12 years from now? You know, and she, you'll probably be looking for a part. If, things, if we're lucky to even be here, you'll be looking for a part. I'll be trying to get a movie made. And that's where we are today. So 12 years in an adult life isn't, I mean, it's a lot. You know, it's 4,300 <laughs> days of your life. But it's, you know, I kind of feel like I haven't changed that much. I got two more kids. I got, you know, we all had, you know, life changes a lot. But kind of the same interest, still doing, doing the same stuff. So kind of stuck with ourselves to some degree. We only have time for like two more. So, yes. Did you encounter any logistical hurdles in being able to bring back a lot of the supporting actors that either you were able to overcome or weren't able to overcome? The, the question is logistical hurdles in the supporting characters. Uh, not really. No, we were, by the end, a lot of the people, they're in it for a year or two, and then, but by the end, you know, especially the graduation party, you see some of them again, that was the idea. So, uh... Everything was a logistical problem, Kathleen can answer yeah. that. I mean, everything was kind of crazy, but it was fun. By the end, the graduation party and some of that, it felt like a family reunion, you know. It's so weird, we had a cast and crew screening two weeks ago, and it was sort of like, wow, you know, seeing people you hadn't seen in 11 years sometimes to, to be at the... Yeah. yeah, so Mindy and the, the characters... Yeah, Mindy and Randy. Mindy and Randy, so they were actually at the cast and crew screening, and, and they're doing well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, we got really lucky. Well. Everybody's doing well. There were people ask, well, what, what, if, what if, you know, something awful would have happened to one of them? I said, well, that would have been awful if something happened to them. That, not, you know, my first thought, I hope, wouldn't be, oh, the film can't, you know. <laughs> it's just like life, you know. You, you, we all hope for the best, and we all have some faith in this future, and that, you know, so statistically, you know. <laughs> There's a good chance of <laughs> that, so we do. It was a leap of faith, though. Maybe it's an optimistic film that way. Just the idea that we would be here all these years later. But you know, you got to believe in the future a little bit. You know? So. I know there are a lot of you, but we're going to go with one more uh, really burning desire. I feel like we favor the front a little bit um, over there. But I did say if something happened to me, Ethan had to finish the film. The last couple of years. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> The question is how Texas is actually a character in the film. Was that intentional? Yeah. I mean, Texas, it's a big state. I remember going, you know, all over the state, moving around and things. And it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't later until I felt kind of like, wow, I haven't really ever left the state. But it, it felt like I had. You know, there's so much. Texas is so varied. So that was just... That was our backdrop. We couldn't afford to, you know, go anywhere else, but, um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, we got a little bit East Texas, a little West Texas, but it's really about Central Texas, Houston, you know, I don't know, it was just, that was the location. The film's very specific in that way, but it's obviously trying to say something much more, you know, universal, I think, about growing up anywhere, you know, so, but I think that can be found in the specific. This film's kind of a contradiction that way. It's very specific, but it's going for something very universal. You know, it's very low budget and indie, but it's kind of trying to, it's an epic too, so it, it, I still feel all those con contradictions flying around the film, so it's, it's, it's kind of a cool feeling. You don't get to feel much. I wish we could, I'm, I'm sorry we yeah. couldn't get to all your questions, but I, I just want to say I, uh, not that it matters necessarily, but uh, this is a singular achievement in film. It's never been done before. It's like one of the masterpieces for all time. I just, Woo! I just am so privileged. Yeah. It's great being here with you guys today.